And so would you be able to describe what supersymmetry theory is or what supersymmetrical particles could be? So uh, we have this theory of how uh, matter is built up out of elementary particles, uh, things like the electron, and then uh, the electrons form atoms because they, they make clouds of our nuclei. And inside the nucleus, you have things called protons and neutrons, but which are not actually elementary particles themselves. They contain more elementary things called quarks. So these quarks, and electrons, and other particles, those are the fundamental constituents of matter. So the theory of supersymmetry postulates that in addition to these particles, which we've already discovered, there's a whole bunch of what I would call sibling particles, which have the same internal properties, uh, like, for example, electric charge. So there would be uh, a supersymmetric partner of the electron, let's call it the selectron, uh, which would have negative charge, just like the electron does. But there's a couple of very important differences. One is that it would weigh a lot more, much heavier mass. And the other thing is that it does not spin. So all the elementary particles that we know of, with one exception that I'll come back to, they all turn around on their axes, a little bit like, like spinning tops. Uh, electron does, for example, uh, the photon, the particle of light, that twists around as well. But the supersymmetric partner of the electron would not. And uh, there would also be a supersymmetric partner of the photon, the uh, particle of light, which would turn around in a different way from the way the photon does. So, as I said, according to supersymmetry, all the known particles have these sibling particles, same internal properties, same interactions, if you like, but different mass and different ways of spinning. And why the need to posit these uh, supersymmetrical particles? So the, the idea of supersymmetry arose from a, attempts to try to unify all the particles into a, a more a more simple picture and uh, so supersymmetry was originally suggested back in the 1970s and then as time went on people thought well actually you know that could be useful for various things so uh, for example uh, supersymmetry could help us understand why particles have the masses that they do and why they don't weigh much more for example uh, the lightest supersymmetric particle uh, is probably stable and it could be around us today in the universe as some sort of invisible dark matter particle as we call it. Uh, so a little parenthesis. So the astronomers, the astrophysicists tell us that in galaxies, in addition to the visible matter in stars, there must be a whole bunch of invisible stuff uh, which provides additional gravitational force which holds the galaxies together. And that additional force could be produced by these heavy supersymmetric particles. And so how do you go about doing this research? What evidence can you look for? So, so there's various different ways in which you could uh, look for supersymmetric particles. So you could imagine producing them uh, in a laboratory experiment. So uh, one of the things that we're doing in experiments at CERN at the Large Hadron Collider, so, so there we bang protons together at the highest possible energies, uh, at the highest possible rates, and look to see what comes out. And it's possible that pairs of supersymmetric particles would come out, or, or more generally, pairs of dark matter particles. Another way in which you could look for supersymmetric particles is, you know, the suggestion is that there are these dark matter particles flying around in the galaxy uh, all the time, in particular, right here, they're, fl they're flying past us. And uh, every once in a while, one of those dark matter particles will hit a piece of regular matter and it will leave behind some energy. And so people are designing very sensitive detectors which can pick up this very small amount of energy that's deposited when one of these dark matter particles comes through. Another thing which you can do is, well, if there are these dark matter particles flying around in our galaxy, every once in a while, a pair of them may collide. And if they do, then their uh, energy will be converted 
into regular particles and then you can look for particular types of conventional particles in the cosmic rays to see whether there's any evidence there of these annihilations of these dark matter particles. And do you think that one of these experiments will be more fruitful than others? Are you working on all of these? So uh, I, I, I'm working on all of them at the same time because th these different experiments uh, tell you different things about where the supersymmetric particles might be, how heavy they might be, and how strongly they can interact. So uh, it's interesting to push in these various different directions and eventually maybe by you know, combining all these results then we may get some better idea of what supersymmetry looks like. Basically, about 95% of the universe we don't understand. And we, we use this term, the dark universe, to describe that part of the universe. The other 5% is the stuff that you and I are made up of, and the Earth and the Moon and the Sun and, and everything we can see. This other 95%, we, we call it dark um, because it's mysterious and we don't understand it. And there are two entities on the dark side. There's something that we call dark matter. That's about a quarter of the universe. And then something that we're going to call dark energy, which is about 75% of the universe. So I should say, you know, that this is all theory that I'm talking about, this dark matter and dark energy. These are names that we use to describe entities that we believe are there, but we have no um, direct proof of the existence of a dark matter particle, and we really have no understanding of where this additional energy source of the universe has come from. Um, so one good theory to explain the dark matter particle is something called supersymmetric theory, um, which comes from particle physics. But the simplest supersymmetric theory model suggests that the Large Hadron Collider in CERN should have already created some of these dark matter particles. And so that's putting that theory into some level of trouble. I mean, it's a very flexible theory, so it's not, not dead in the water yet. Um, but I, I think over the next 10 years, uh, I'm going to say 20 years, if the particle physicists don't discover a dark matter particle, then I will start getting increasingly worried about as astronomers, we need this, this dark matter component in our universe to understand the observations that we make. Um, and as I say, all the tests I've done of Einstein's theory of general relativity so far have, have come back. I mean, it is the best tested theory that we have, it, and it works beautifully. Your, your sat nav wouldn't work if you didn't understand, or well, you don't have to understand it, but <laughs> if engineers and scientists didn't understand Einstein's theory of general relativity, your sat nav wouldn't work. So we, we, we know this theory works well, but maybe it works differently um, in different parts of the universe. Uh, these are things that we can test. I, I, I think it probably will work fine, but we can test it, and that's the important thing. So you're not taken in by the sort of grand uh, theory of supersymmetry? Um, so supersymmetry has lots of uh, l elegance. <laughs> uh, so there are three forces. There are four forces in the universe. There's gravity, which is... Uh, sort of off on one side and then we have the electromagnetic strong and weak forces and supersymmetry allows you to understand how those three forces kind of work together how back in the um, in the very hot environments of the early universe right after the big bang how those three would have been very similar and that uh, gives us a, a good understanding of where those forces are coming from um, and then one can go to the next step of how do we unite gravity in as well so it's a, a beautifully elegant theory and I think that's why people have spent so much time working on it um, I like the theory because it gives me uh, a, a good theoretical grounding for what the dark matter particle will be, which is you know, what I'm particularly interested in. And it's genuinely disappointing that it hasn't been realised at CERN yet. I mean, how excited would it be if they actually found one? So exciting. <laughs> I used to work at CERN and I still go out and work there a lot. So I work on their data and I work on uh, mathematical models of particle physics uh, and how and forces and the early universe and m my area of work is really between the data and theory trying to inform one by the other and sort of back things back and forwards um, and up until last year I spent all my career work working on the supersymmetry theory which is a theory of uh, particle physics and uh, but we, we thought that the Large Hadron Collider experiment at CERN was going to produce particles predicted, new particles predicted by the supersymmetry theory, and it hasn't. Like this, this hope hasn't panned out. So I've kind of shifted 
what, uh, what I'm working on. But uh, the supersymmetry theory was beautiful to work on for a while. It, was, it had very lofty ideals. It, it, was a, it was a bridge to theories of everything, um, theory, like mathematical theories of all particles and forces, um, which tr tried to explain everything about our universe. So, um, you know, dark matter, how forces work, what, what we're ma made of, um, you know, what light is, everything. Um, but you, the problem with them was you had to make quite a lot of assumptions um, to, to predict just a few things that you could measure and test in an experiment. And then we looked in the experiment and they weren't there. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, so I had to rethink last year. Um, and now I'm working in a different mode. Um, I'm looking at the data and looking for glitches. Um, so we predict with the standard model of particle physics, that's the current knowledge that we have, uh, we predict how the data should look uh, from the collisions uh, between two protons at, uh, at CERN at high energies. Um, and we look for cases where the, the model disagrees, the prediction disagrees with what's, what's seen. Um, and then for the, that for me is an opportunity. So then we, uh, we jump on that and try and explain it, but explain it in a very simple way. We kind of just bung in an extra force or an extra particle that would explain the, what's seen. Um, and then we do some proper phenomenology. So we, we uh, try and suggest other ways in which it may be tested. We first of all check that it's consistent with all other data um, and then suggest other ways you can sieve the data to um, look for these new particles or forces. Um, and then, uh, you know, go one step further in the theoretical direction. So this is more, we call it bottom-up um, science, working from the data and where you've got really solid foundation and you think you know what's going on, and then um, making hypotheses away from that. Um, so I'm enjoying this uh, new way of working. It's certainly quite different to the previous way where you try and solve everything um, and make loads of assumptions. That's That we call top-down, you know, it's like you start from pure th thought and then try and get to experimental uh, observations. Um, but for me, anyway, that, that, that approach hasn't panned out. So uh, you know, I'm trying a new approach and it's, uh, and it's a lot of fun. So this change in starting from the data rather than theory, does this mean that you've sort of given up hope of finding supersymmetrical particles? No. <laughs> okay, so is the work still focused on supersymmetry? Or are you, that's just a belief you have, but you've kind of like... No, I, I okay, so looking at my own work at the moment, the way, the way I answer this question is, the way for me to make progress right now is not to work on supersymmetry. And the reason is because we know from the data that the Large Hadron Collider has seen already that in the next few years, there's not going to be a big discovery of super, supersymmetric particles. Otherwise, we would have seen small fluctuations in the data already. So in the next years, for me, that's not where the discovery is going to be, so I'm looking elsewhere. But still, you know, you can't help in your heart of hearts um, believe in this beautiful theory which explains um, a really important fact um, that uh, we otherwise don't understand. And that fact is, um, why is the Higgs boson so light? So if you, if you do calculations on Higgs bosons, um, they're, they're affected by quantum fluctuations, the, little, the seething of space-time in terms of other particles. And they're, re they're special in that they feel those fluctuations extremely sensitively. And if you do back-of-the-envelope calculations, those fluctuations should increase its mass by something like a billion, billion times more than, it, than it's been measured to be. So this this is a puzzle that we don't understand with our current theory. It's not explained why is the Higgs boson so light and how is it able to stay so light with these quantum fluctuations. Um, supersymmetry explains this. It doesn't mean it's the only, that doesn't mean it's the only explanation, um, but the other ones don't work or, you know, we haven't really found a decent other one. So that's why we were so um, keen on, on it and why we thought we might be able to um, find supersymmetric particles as a signal that the theory was right at the Large Hadron Collider. So, you know, 
if in, uh, I don't know, five or ten years' time, some signals start appearing from the data, of course, I'm going to jump back right back on it, right? But uh, for the moment, I think, in terms of progress, it's, it, it's more fruitful for me personally to, to look elsewhere. So, supersymmetry, as far as we can tell, is an essential feature of this theory called string theory, which is, for my mind, the only serious candidate we have for an all-encompassing theory of everything. So I think if we found evidence for supersymmetry, then the next item on the agenda would be to try to find some sort of positive evidence for string theory one way or another. But that looks pretty tough. String theory is trying to explain what we are made of, how the universe works at the most fundamental level. What are the basic ingredients? What are the forces between particles? How did the universe come to be? How does a black hole work? What does the future of the universe hold for us? All the deep questions that everybody wants to know, it's kind of like, yeah, of course, I want to know that. Does this field have anything to say about that? And indeed, string theory has, begin, has begun to offer us some some context into, in terms of which we can begin to answer these deep questions. For example, we have learned that the, the matter in the universe is all unified into one. That unity is quite amazing, and that's what's one of the elegant things which at once sounds philosophical, at the same time is a unifying principle of explaining all of physics. So while one must, might think that, oh, this sounds like very just wishful thinking about aesthetic, this has come out to be real in the context of string theory and be realized. So, so we are fortunate to be having such a structure where it potentially explains everything around us in terms of this unifying picture, in terms of how the matter all comes together, how the forces get unified, and how that comes to describe the geometry of space and time, how does Einstein's theory fit with quantum mechanics, how do the black holes come to the picture, how did the Big Bang work, how, what's going to happen in the future, all them together, from the smallest to the biggest, from how forces work to how everything macroscopically behaves. So what kind of significance or consequences does string theory lead? Why should we care about strong string theory today? Well, it is the reason we care about string theory is that we believe Einstein had the correct description of gravity, which is a geometric picture of how gravity works by the curvature of space and time. On the other hand, we also know at the microscopic level, the tiniest level, quantum mechanics is important, how the atoms work. Since we know quantum mechanics is a fact of life in the real, in the, in the real world, in the microscopic regime, and Einstein's theory seems to be correct in a macroscopic description of gravitational forces. Well, if you take Einstein's theory and take it to the extreme of smaller and smaller, shorter and shorter microscopic uh, descriptions of it, you better have a consistent theory with quantum mechanics. And there is no other framework today which is consistent with Einstein's theory and quantum mechanics at the same time. String theory is the only candidate we have which combines Einstein's theory with quantum mechanics in a consistent framework. And how is it that it brings about that gap between Einstein's theory and quantum? It is actually one of the miracles. We don't understand how it does it. What we found is that if you study these uh, vibrating strings, which are these excitations that we have, one of the modes, one of the little modes that these strings have, which is very tiny strings, turns out to have exactly the same properties as, a, as mediating gravitational force. That is, that exchange of this little thing between other particles mediates gravitational force between them. Why it had to have this property is not clear, but it turned out that this, this theory just does it. And so many things in string theory, we don't understand why it works, and it's really magical. And part of the reason we believe in it is that nobody put it in by hand. It's not like if somebody says, you know what, I'm bored, I want to put this thing in, so let me just change my theory so it has gravity in it. No. People studied, started studying string theory and they say, oh, there's gravity in this. I didn't put it in. Where did that come from? So it gives more credibility to the theory. It kind of brings out things we want to have without actually putting it in. So we believe that's one of the beautiful aspects of string theory, this magical property, that things that you get out of it are more than what you put in. Are there any grand theories, such as like string theory or domestic symmetry, that, that capture your imagination? Well, uh, string theory certainly captured all our imaginations when it was formulated. I was I remember listening in certain theory lecture room to when the first anomaly cancellation was discovered in string theory, this was 1984, and everyone was thinking, you know, within two, three years, we'll, everything will be sorted out. 
Well, that was, what was it? Over 34, 35, 35, 36 years ago. That's because it has turned out to be much more difficult than people thought. And uh, no, the idea was that the strings themselves, their dynamics create the space time in which the strings move. But that has proved too ambitious a construction. So currently all of string theory is formulated in a flat space time background in Minkowski space time. Uh, which means that the real dynamics of what string theory could tell you, we still don't know about. It's just too difficult. It's already very, very difficult at this stage. And the full string theory, nobody really even knows what string theory is. That's what, you know, I know some real string theories and that's what they tell me. That it's hard to even formulate what is string theory. So in a sense, I guess we are lucky that we have hit upon something like that, which has got such depth and complexity. But at the same time, progress is frustratingly slow. But then that's really because we are impatient. If you look at the history of science, most things took, you know, century to work out. And why do you expect that in 35 years we'll have the answers? So I think we should give string theory more time and string theories more time. Uh, but they should perhaps also be a bit modest and not claim that they're going to solve everything in three years. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI-TV.